slide, but let's just go right ahead and get to the column that, that you wrote. Tell us a little bit about what happened with the Nation Without God from the prayer. Well, you know, I had watched all the inaugural, uh, inaugural address only for his speech. I did not watch the beginning when the uh, person had said, uh, Ever Myers had gone into her speech. Now, she was the first person that was a lay person ever to do this speech, and it kind of showed that, didn't it? Um, she started talking, and she mentioned uh, a segment of the pledge, but she used without God. Now, the president picks who he wants to speak for him, and this was evidence of the kind of a message that he wanted to send. Certainly. And just to clarify so that people understand, uh, she she didn't say the words without God, but she just skipped over God. She said one nation, indivisible. And indivisible, yeah. And then she went uh, and then she skipped it and then said with liberty and justice for all. Right, right. And so what what do you think the, Hello? What do you think this says about the country and where Obama's coming from? Well, what I believe is that uh, Obama is a statist. He believes that all of our rights come from government, not from God or our natural to man, which is the way the uh, original founders thought. And as a result, he kind of sends that message uh, to people when he puts people, lay people out that skip things like that. And it's not the first time that Obama has left things out. For instance, I, I believe in 2011 in Thanksgiving, he did not mention God at, at all. And, and that's very central to the idea of being a statist. And so when, when you look at what a statist means, explain to everyone, give, give some examples of how a statist or may speak compared to someone who has a belief in God and doesn't mind invoking God. In, right. in the primary difference between a, a statist and someone who is not is that a statist believes that the government is the most highest moral authority there is, whereas other people, such as the founders, and, and I think most Americans, believe that our rights are inherent. Now, if you believe that all of our rights come from government, then you can also believe that government has the right to take those away. Now, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, it says that our rights are inalienable. Now, that was codified in the Constitution. That's why when you see the president uh, make laws that get around the Constitution or bend the, the purpose of the Constitution, this is the political theory that he's coming from that government is central to uh, everything. Uh, everything. And so what do you think that the, um, the whole concept behind what happened? Because certainly we have to assume, right, that he looked at what people were saying that day and that someone from his campaign, I'm not saying that it was Barack Obama personally, right, right. someone from his campaign had to have looked at that, right? So what do you think that means? Then that they allowed that to get through. Do you think that is symbolic of what's to come? Well, take a look at uh, the recent attacks on the Second Amendment. Um, when he talks about making executive orders, he says, I'm going to do this if Congress doesn't act. Uh, he says uh, that he will pass these executive orders based on common sense thinking rather than constitutional law or traditional American institutions. And explain, one of the things that you talked about in your um, column is that the Obama administration seems to back down on some of the cues that are given and that he is saying right. things through his own lifestyle choices. So tell us about that, because that certainly does seem interesting, especially for people who you know, believe in these conspiratorial theories that maybe there's something else going on there. Well, no, I, I don't believe it's – that it's conspiratorial. I, you know, when I talk about uh, statism, I, I talk about a moral prerogative, not necessarily a conspiracy to destroy America. And his uh, his viewpoint is one uh, I would say that's similar to many other leaders currently. For instance, Dilma Rousseff in in Brazil, uh, Hugo Chavez. 
um, they're not conspiracy in the sense that they're part of a major international organization. It's that they believe that government is the be-all and end-all of existence. In other words, government solves all, government uh, uh, basically uh, derives its moral authority from human uh, moral precedent. And tell us, Tom, a little bit about some of the other things that you've written, because I know you're an, an author. You write a lot of columns. Right. That's really what you do from a, from a professional level. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, when you talk about uh, in, in this column in, in relationship to other columns, I, I've written a number of columns uh, about this subject. And I've said that I, I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make are that God and religion are the same thing. And uh, some of the people that are opposed to conservatism or opposed to Republican Party say, well, they want to create a government that's a theological government. Not necessarily. Uh, when I talk about under God or about God, uh, it's part of a non-denominational theory, just like the founders were. Now, I, you know, someone made a comment on the column that, uh, well, he, you know, he said that uh, this is because of a uh, connection between church and state. Well, he did right. not say under Jesus. He said under God, and God is right. non-denominational. And many people confuse the two. Um, when you say that you you believe that uh, certain things come from God, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a Christian or Jewish faith. It means that there is a higher authority than government. Now, if a person believes that government is not the highest authority, that God is our high authority, and that our rights are derived from God and are inherent in man, then naturally this threatens the power of the state. It makes it possible for an individual to question the authority of the state. And that's a problem for someone who is a statist, because o obedience to the law is essential to a statist theorist. So go ahead then and tell us some of the other things that you write about, some of their books and columns and things like that. Tell us right. some of the other things that you've been involved well, in. Well, I'll tell you, the the most popular two books that I've written are the Conservative Chronicles. And what they are is I it, over the last couple of years, you'll take columns, and most columns are limited by editorial content, 600, 700 words. Uh, in the Conservative Chronicles, I take the same ideas from the blogs, and I've expanded them into two or 3,000 words and back it up with uh, extensive uh, documentation so that people can understand it. You know, I, a lot of times on columns when you write a column, people will often put in, in the replies or the comments, well, where are you, all your sources and this kind of thing. Like, well, if you write every possible source or every possible backup for everything, the thing will run into 3,000 words, and you can't do that. So – that's why in the book, The Conservative Chronicles, it goes into more detail about every idea. For instance, there's an entire chapter on why our rights are derived from God and where, mm -hmm. what's God's role in government. Um, there was a, a column I wrote, uh, Is Jesus a Conservative? You know, one of the things, <laughs> well, Jesus was alive today. Uh, he would be a he would be a liberal because you know he believes in redistribution and wealth and everything, and and it explains the theological concepts also in relationship to conservatism. Mm -hmm. So if people want to get a copy of that, where can they find it? Uh, you can get it on Amazon or any Barnes and Noble. Um, the first book I wrote, Return of the Kings, discussed how uh, statism is a return really to feudalism, where the government owns and controls all the resources. And it's uh, up to the government to decide how to distribute them. Interesting. So tell us a little bit, too, about how you write. I know that's something that a few people have told me a little bit about, your yeah. um, kind of your pattern of how you do things every day to get the information that you write on. Because, you know, you really are very dedicated to it. It's really what you live and breathe. So well, how, how, how do you go about that? I, the, I have a very uh, unusual writing method. I start at about 2 a.m. Uh, I usually typically start writing a column based on the days before research, and then I go till about 4 or 4 or 5.30, and then I start listening to the radio shows and about what are people talking about. You know, what is the hot topic? What happened in wow. the news? Uh, and then I'll follow the, the, the radio shows for most of the morning, until about mid-afternoon, and then I can usually catch a couple hours of sleep. It's kind of dead during the day. Then I can catch the evening <laughs> news and start formulating ideas. You know, writing is not, uh, especially about government and politics, is very topical. 
and you have to stay on top of your game and bring people a subject that they want to talk about. And For instance, the column that I wrote for you last week, the uh, One Nation Without God, was based on all the different news reports that were coming in and what people were talking about. Um, politics is a very topical subject, and you have to stay that way. So how do you go about finding the topics then that you want to talk about? How's that how's that something you gauge as a writer? Because I know there are a lot of people out right. there who, you know, who do write and they blog and so for those who really enjoy writing, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, the best way to do it uh is to write every day. Um most people say, Well, I, I think I'd like to talk about this or I, I think I'd like to talk about that. And even if you don't publish every day, I would strongly urge you need to write about 1,000 to 2,000 words a day, and that's usually about a column, a column and a half. It doesn't mean you should publish every day or you should put everything on your blog, but getting in the habit of writing makes you a better writer. Um, typical source material I use is only uh, primary sources, which means you don't use Wikipedia. Uh, you don't use um, secondhand reports of everything. Now, uh, you can use it to find out where to look. For instance, when you look on any Wikipedia article, it'll have a list of, you know, where's that from, the source or whatever. You go to that source and then cross reference it uh, and see if mm -hmm. it's accurate. Um, primary sources, uh, AP reports, Reuters reports, um, for instance, when I'm discussing any uh, article on the Constitution, uh, I often refer back to the Federalist Papers, the personal letters between Thomas Jefferson, Adams, and some of the other leaders, um, all the associated cross materials of that. That's the, really the best way. For instance, when you're writing about the Second Arg Ar Ar uh, Amendment, you have to understand why they wrote it, what they really meant by uh, the right to keep and bear arms. Um, does were they talking about sophisticated weapons? Were they talking about personal arms? What is a well-regulated militia? The only way you can do that is to understand the way the person uh, thinks. So it sounds like you really take a lot of time then, and this is something that I, I, I want to really boil down, I guess, to some of these basics, because there are a lot of people out there who are trying to write, they blog, they submit articles to various sites, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's just not interesting because it's all opinion, and there's nothing really to back it up. And I think part of why your columns do so well, and they do very well on the Brenner Brief as, as well, is because, yes, you give opinion, but all of the opinions that you give are very well documented, and you back up and you explain where they're coming from. You, you're you framing it based on primary sources and based on other documentation, so it really makes it a lot more interesting. And that's, that's a pattern, really, that I think a lot of you can learn from and be yeah. able to pattern that. Well, when you write your opinion, you have to write an opinion that's maybe – uh, it, it's interesting in the way that it's slightly different. In other words, you can't say, um, uh, let's say on this issue, well, Obama is godless. Well, that's not really what the article is about. The article is, uh, what is it that motivated him to put a layperson in for the first time in U.S. history and then allow that kind of a speech to go unargued? You know, um, right. it, it's the fundamental background of why somebody does something is important as much as it is your opinion of it. You're not expressing your opinion. You're expressing why this has happened. Right, right. Well, good. Well, I certainly want to thank you, Tom, for coming on tonight, and I apologize for whatever the audio problem no, was a little I, bit earlier. Maybe it but was, uh, yeah, maybe it was some bandwidth problem or whatever, you know, that these kind of things happen. No problem, but thank you so much for your patience. And if you want to check out uh, Tom Purcell's columns, you can go to thebrennerbrief.com. And, Tom, what is your personal website? My personal website is thomaspurcell.com. Now, there's a hyphen in between Thomas and Purcell. Uh, somebody had bought thomaspurcell.com, one word, and uh, has set up their own website. Um, on that website, um, there's when I publish a book, there's two ways you can get it. You can get it either on paperback, uh, the traditional way, or you can download it for your Kindle. 
Um, if you download it for your Kindle, if you want to try just the sample, you can go to my website and you can get one chapter for the, the Conservative Chronicles, or any chapter you like, for only a buck ninety nine. So you can try it out, wow. and then if you like it, you can get the whole book for ten bucks. Or you can go to thebrennerbrief dot com for free and see your writing style and know right. that the book will be wonderful. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh-huh. Well, thanks again for coming oh, on and, tonight. Uh, one Thomas. last thing. Yeah. I've written a follow-up article for all the comments saying we yes. want to know about the research, and I've yes. submitted it to you if you'd yes. like to publish it. Yep. Um, it, it explains all the history behind all that status uh, thinking. Yep, and it's going to go up, I think, either tomorrow or Wednesday. So, yeah, okay. that's going to be an interesting follow-up. Thank you for, for mentioning that for us as well. So, Thomas okay. Purcell, thanks again for coming on tonight. Contributor oh, thank with you the, for having me. Thank you for having you're me. You're welcome. Contributor with thebrennerbrief.com and his website, again, thomas-purcell.com. And we'll make sure to link to his website on the um, on the show prep at the end of the show tonight. So you'll be able to just link right there to Thomas's website. We're going to take just a very, very quick break.